uh, I should discuss something about the current and the emerging trends in dental forensics, which is happening currently in the world. Uh, I'm proud to represent my institute, the Government Dental College and Hospital, one of the oldest dental institutes in India, and uh, also the second government dental college to be recognized or to, to have the NABH accreditation. In this, uh, we all know that the basic funda behind the evolution of forensic odontology or the use of dentistry in forensic science, uh, the basic uh, behind that is the truth reveals the truth because uh, forensic, uh, the main concept of forensic is to reveal the truth and how the dentistry will be applicable in revealing the truth in some forensic cases. So that is why teeth are the valuable source of information, uh, not only to the clinical, but also to the forensic and to the anthropological sciences. Uh, this is a common fact. Uh, actually, I have been seeing uh, in the last few days that uh, the audience in this particular e-conference are not uh, skewed towards dentistry. I can see a plethora of you know the audiences from diverse uh, uh, fields of uh, forensic, uh, forensic medicine, uh, forensic odontology, and also several branches of dentistry. Uh, so I thought I wish I should keep my uh, presentation to the very basic level uh, because uh, the majority of the audience are not uh, pure uh, uh, forensic odontologists. So. Uh, the basic thing we should know about uh, is that the teeth are the most robust and the hardest tissues in the human body. Most of you are aware of it. And hence they are, uh, you know, resistant to the thermal and um, to various environmental insults and also to the decomposition. So to, they survive any type of, you know, insults. So that is one of the reason, the basic why we apply this teeth for uh, forensic purposes. Also, the dental characteristics are so unique to individuals, just like the fingerprints. And so that is a factor or the parameter which can be useful as a tool in human identification. So these are the two bases why we evolved a tooth is evolving as a, as a parameter or as a tool in forensic science. And as such, we see the dentistry's role in forensic is uh, Though there are several domains in forensic dentistry, uh, the mostly uh, it is concentrated on forensic human identification, uh, especially in the mass uh, uh, disaster victim identification cases. Of course, bite mark uh, investigations, almost there are certain debates on the application of bite marks. Uh, crime scene investigations, death investigations, DNA analysis and dental expert witness. Now, the reason why I have kept the last four in a different color is because these are the uh, less touched topics in forensic uh, dentistry in uh, various conferences or in various uh, organizations. So that is why we need to concentrate that. And ultimate goal of any uh, forensic odontologist or uh, in any forensic case is to identify the individual from a decomposed state or a skeletal case or uh, in a charred, uh, severely charred case like the one you see here. Uh, that way, you know, we can establish the biologic profile of the deceased, which can narrow down the search or which can help in, you know, correlate the finding or with the antemortem and the postmortem data. So elucidation of this biological profiling is one of the main areas for a forensic dentist. So uh, with this, thus we can see that the dentistry has proved useful in the field of forensics and thus has led to the genesis of uh, a new branch in dentistry. Of course, not much recognized here in India, but it has evolved as a specialized branch in the past few years I've been witnessing based on the number of organ conferences and the number of workshops or webinars related to forensic dentistry. So we define this as a branch of dentistry, which in the interest of justice deals with the proper handling and examination of dental evidences and with the proper evaluation and presentation of the dental findings. This is the definition given by FDI. Uh, from the definition itself, you can see that, uh, you know, it, sorry, 
you can see that uh, it starts with the collection of the specimen or handling of the uh, specimen. Then comes the examination part and then lastly comes the presentation of these findings in the court of law. But what uh, we have been observing is much importance is being given to the middle part, that is the examination of dental evidences. Various hands-on courses and various uh, conferences are highlighting mainly, for example, the age estimation part or the sex determination part or the bite mark analysis part or the human identification part. But some importance also need to be given in forensic odontology, in the in the crime scene investigation, or especially uh, looking at the specimen at the uh, at the first time itself, and handling the specimen, packaging of the specimen, transportation of the specimen, and at last, you know how to present the report in the court of law. So these last two parts are somewhat missed. So this is. As the title itself says that the emerging trend. So we need to focus much on these two end aspects of the definition uh, for the forensic odontology to emerge as a, as a highly specialized branch in dentistry. So this is just a small message uh, so that we need to concentrate in the future on the first and the last aspect of this definition. Uh, we know that uh, dentistry is a specialty branch with multiple super specialties. So almost all the branches of dentistry uh, contribute for the development of forensic odontology or in other way, I can say that forensic odontology branch takes the inputs from all the existing and recognized branches of dentistry. Though forensic odontology alone as a standalone branch is not recognized here in India, but it has the contributions from other branches. And that is why I uh, commonly call that forensic odontology is an adopted child of these two departments in dentistry, that is the oral medicine and oral radiology and oral pathology. Uh, because as per the Dental Council of India's uh, uh, recommendations now, uh, after 2007, the forensic odontology branch comes under these two specialty of uh, dentistry, that is the oral medicine and radiology branch and also the oral pathology uh, branch. So, however, other branches like the prostodontia, those who are non-dentists here may, uh, may not be well versed with these definitions, but all other branches of uh, dentistry also contribute for, for example, I can say the prostodontia department may uh, deals with the dentures, making a fabrication of the dentures or the fabrication of implants to the patients. Uh, however, the denture uh, labeling, the denture marking, uh, there are various methods which we'll see in the due course. Uh, may also help in the human identification when no teeth are present and the person, the victim is wearing a mm, complete denture. So like that, you know, the various branches contribute for this. Uh, still, uh, it has been a belief that only the oral pathology and oral medicine are highly concentrating on forensic odontology. It is not the case. Other branches also need to contribute much for the evolution of forensic odontology. Now, uh, my lecture will be divided into various domains like how the dentistry is applicable in forensic human identification, how it will be useful in age estimation, how it will be useful in sex determination. So the due course we will be going according to these slides. So we know we'll start with the forensic human identification. And uh, as per the Interpol's guidelines, it has been proved that uh, the dental parameters are one of the uh, one of the three primary methods of identification, next to fingerprints and uh, uh, the DNA. And uh, the the amount of information we get from the oral cavity, it's not only the the nature, the status of the dentition, the number of the teeth. Uh, the condition of the pathologies in the oral cavity. Apart from this uh, information, the oral cavity can give information related to the socioeconomic status, 
It can also give information on the diet influence and the environmental influences on the teeth. Like for example, the uh, common example I can give is the fluorosis because of the intake of fluoridated water more so that the color of the teeth is influenced on this amount of fluoride present, the occupational status, the culture, the habits, ancestry, stress factors. So a wide variety of information the oral cavity can provide okay, if it is concentrated in a, in a greater scale. So with this information, what we collect from the oral cavity of a deceased person, so may help us in narrow downing the identification process, okay, during the forensic human identification. When we talk about a particular tooth, you can, from the teeth itself, you know, the habits, the occupation, anatomical changes in the teeth, the treatments which they have undergone, the type of materials which was used in the treatment, all those information can be obtained from the teeth. So this some pictorial uh, examples like the uniqueness you can see in the first picture the uh, tooth which is extra tooth we call it supernumerary here so that is one unique characteristics we can tell a person like uh, how the teeth was there in that person we can tell there was an extra teeth in that so that is a valuable information we get uh, the amount of where the, this in such bite mark cases, if you know this amount of breakage, what I can call is a fracture here in that in the in this angle of the tooth. So that will be reflected in the bite mark, you know, when we do the analysis. So this unique class, this unique characteristic will be of useful. Especially here in this case, you see the severely attrited case. So this may uh, give some information on the uh, psychological or the emotional or the stress factors, or sometimes even the dietary as well as the parafunctional factors of that particular function. For example, he may be a night grinder where he constantly chews the teeth and produces sound at night. So this type of grinding may result in this type of attrition of the teeth. Okay, some people have the habit of applying the lemon or, you know, in order to whiten their teeth. So such type of information, you can see this erosion, chemical erosion in the teeth and a duplicate teeth here. I'll be using the layman's terminology as much as possible. Now, uh, identification from the teeth, not only the victim, but identifying uh, a criminal also, especially there are various parameters, but current trends, you know, when coming to the dentistry part, the bite marks are proving to be a useful uh, a parameter in the identification of the criminal, especially in the sexual assault cases, which involves bite marks. And uh, when identifying the victim, of course, we always need to rely, as a forensic odontologist, need to rely on the postmortem and the antimortem uh, dental records if it is available. So the comparison reconciliation process, when doing this comparison of the antimortem and the postmortem dental records, we may land up into some conclusions that it may be included or excluded. And uh, we can narrow down the identification if we can perform the dental age estimation of the specimens provided. Like, you know, uh, the specimen which we would have got is uh, maybe in the adolescent stage, whereas the police is searching for, uh, or whereas in the Panchnama report, it would have been written that the patient, that the person is around the age of 40 to 50 years. So based on our report, the police can uh, search, narrow down their search of the, the uh, absconding person. Also the sex determination, we know that 50% of the, of the identification process is solved if you can identify the gender properly from the teeth or from the jaws. So based on all these uh, parameters, uh, we can help in the identification of a, a victim also. In this particular, uh, you can see one of our cases where we uh, did the age and gender estimation just only with the mandible. So we could also you know, successfully identify the age as well as the gender in this case. And we also uh, suggested to the police that if we can provide the anti-mortem photograph of this particular person, she was a girl of around 25 years old. 
So probably would have taken a selfie image using a camera or any photograph where a smile is visible. So we can compare the amount of space present here between the between the lateral incisor, uh, uh, between the canine and the first premolar here. So that would have been a vital, you know, clue or to link this particular uh, specimen with that particular person. Now, ultimately, what we require conventional methods. The current trends what we use is the is we call it as a pink tooth. Uh, sorry, the pink form and the yellow form. The the pink form is for the postmortem uh, uh, findings, and the yellow form is the antemortem uh, dental records. So uh, the during the dental autopsy procedures, we we enter the details. We make a dental profiling of that victim using this uh, pink form and. Uh, uh, if we if we can try to get the antemortem dental records from the dentist or from the family members, then a comparison can be done. This was a classical method, but now you know the computer based. Now the trend is changing. Now the computer based methods are being applied because the classical method it was a laborious procedure and there are uh, chances of uh, errors being produced. Uh, so now the use of uh, image processing uh, techniques are there and uh, we also use certain algorithms, you know, the machine learning process are there uh, with the evolution of uh, uh, certain uh, softwares like the WinID, uh, the CAPME, the PLAS data. So these uh, softwares can be used, uh, which will take care of the, you know, comparison process and give the uh, research. So this is the evolving trend and it's not new now, it has been decade old, but now this system is also being upgraded. Uh, we took a process pro project, uh, you know, with, in GFSU where uh, we tried to prove the you know, uniqueness of the dentition. Uh, we took around, uh, it's an ongoing process, nearly 750 bite marks uh, were recorded in a very innovative method. And uh, we tried to assess the individual class characteristics uh, using a software. So this um, is an ongoing process. And using this imaging technologies, uh, using the Python language, a software is being created so that you know whenever any bite mark uh, or an individual uh, individual's dentition pattern is being submitted to the database, it does uh, search and gives a record. It provided the record is present in the uh, database. Now, what will happen if there is no teeth? If there are no teeth and uh, the patient or the person is totally edentulous uh, and is wearing a denture. So now, as I mentioned already in the, the role of prosodontia, uh, now the technology is improving where we can use the RFID tracks and scan uh, disk. Uh, these chips are also can be incorporated in the dentures when they are whenever they are fabricated barcoding systems are being applied so in case of mass disasters especially you know when there is a commingling of the bodies where the this where the dentures uh, are scattered outside the mouth and they are lying uh, scattered so that is the that is the reason why i told that forensic odontologist uh, involvement should be there in the search operation should be there in the scene itself. It is not like forensic odontologists sit in a room and do, do, they do their work. So they need to enter the field and you know do the search operation, look for certain dental evidences like this and try to correlate it with the person and try to retract the records from this type of dental evidences as useful in the dental identification of the person. So this is also one such evolving trend which, which need to be strengthened. Uh, then coming to the lip prints, you know, from uh, the uh, forensic point of view, uh, not much studied, but however, uh, it's based on uh, a certain principle. I hope uh, the forensic science experts can identify the person uh, in this photograph here is Edmund Locard, whose principle we follow, that's the principle of extreme. Okay, uh, so like uh, 
the lip prints also just like fingerprints they can uh, they are characteristic and unique to a person and they may uh, they may leave some traces in the you know whenever they come in contact with certain substances so based on that how they can be used in uh, uh, this forensic science it's the same principle like how we leave the latent print this is just a demonstration of uh, uh, work like uh, a lip print has been identified and using the same powders which is used for the uh, lifting the uh, fingerprint, the same can be used. However, this is a conventional method, but the analysis part, we may rely on the digital technology, especially the digital image analysis softwares like the Photoshop or Image. So uh, this is one of the study done by uh, in Goa a GDC Goa, where they have used the computer software to, these are all on research point of view. However, how they are going to be used applicable in the court of law is again a question because there are no standards provided. As a previous, uh, um, as the first uh, speaker of the day was telling today that we need to have certain uh, established standards for this type of evidences to be applicable in the court of law. So again, you know, the research community, the forensic odontology researchers working in the field, they need to concentrate on such things. Uh, now, to narrow down the identification, of course, blood grouping also uh, may be useful. And if you have only the tooth as the only evidence from the crime scene, now how that can be used? So this was during one of my training in Forensic Science Laboratory, Ahmedabad, that we did on uh, how the tooth can be used. Uh, you know, it is done on an extracted tooth and how the procedures for uh, uh, getting the blood group of this particular uh, person. Uh, coming to the next uh, unique characteristic uh, for identification, that is the palatal rugae. Uh, it's much studied the topic. You know, we have also come across uh, with the integrated rugae chart by Dr. Aman. So this conventional methods of using rugae, of course, for research point of view, especially when uh, there is a case of burning case, charred body. And usually because of the presence of the tongue and the position of the head during this burning process, the palatal rugae's anatomy or the structure are preserved. So we should take advantage of those preserved structures uh, and that can be useful in the further identification, especially if the person is a denture wearer because the pattern of the rugae will have an imprint on the denture undersurface and if that denture is coded or labeled, then identification process of that person becomes easier. Now the current trend is use of three-dimensional technologies, use of surface scanners. 3D scanners are now being used. 3D uh, models of these dental models are prepared and overlay of this uh, uh, suspect and the, you know, the original anti-mortem dental models, they can be you know, compared and uh, correlation can be given. So this is how palatal rugae process can be uh, applicable in the trends. Now, when we uh, see this, uh, we need to use a lot of instrumentation in uh, like, like in a routine forensic uh, investigations, forensic odontology also requires the use of uh, many instruments and the uh, uh, forensic microscopy. The microscopes are the most favored, uh, preferred and uh, uh, um, instruments, especially in doing this type of investigation. Uh, so this was one of the chart we prepared myself and my colleague, Dr. Arushi, when we were students in GFSU. So we had this presentation done in a Goa conference. So uh, I tried to you know, brief the role of uh, uh, microscopy in uh, forensic odontology. So especially when you see the comparison microscopes, when we can compare the bite mark analysis. So we did in a, in a, a bite 
mark on a, on a surface and uh, suspects uh, dental models. So we can use this method of comparison, comparison of the bite mark with the suspects dental model. Also the Ruge pattern analysis or the comparison also can be uh, executed. So this type of uh, you know, evolving trends need to be emphasized. Uh, also, the stereo microscope for uh, examining the minute surface details of the uh, tooth structures that may help us in the identifying certain pathologies within the tooth or outside the tooth or uh, estimating uh, the counting the number of the you know, incremental lines so that the estimation of the age can be uh, done in a more accurate way. So this evolving trend needs to be addressed here. Now, coming to the age estimation, this alone is a separate domain of forensic odontology. It's a huge topic and, uh, you know, uh, we are cutting short it now. We are not going to discuss the methodology involved in each, but however, the importance and the emerging trends in age estimation we need to address. Uh, clinically or with the specimen based on the emergence of the tooth or maybe an alveolar emergence or a clinical emergence, based on the, the most favored uh, you know, method, the most accurate method of the uh, root apex closure parameter, uh, based on the attrition parameter, though it is subjective, but it's an attrition parameter, uh, based on the other uh, parameters uh, which are given by Gustafsson's method, and the most preferred uh, radiological method, that is the demergent staging of the development of the tooth, the dentinal translucency method and the pulp tooth ratio method. So there are a plethora of measures which you can use for estimation of the dental age. Okay, however, we always start with the conventional atlas method. This is the normal trend. Whenever any age estimation case comes, this is my principle that we always start with the ATLAS method, which is already given Mashler and Shores map. ATLAS is already there. Uh, any dental graduates, you know, they would have already seen this image. But now, you know, the trend is after 2010, there is a evolution of a new ATLAS that we call it as the London ATLAS. But the main drawback of using this ATLAS method is that they are not sex specific. Uh, we cannot use a separate um, ATLAS for a male and uh, for a female. So they are not spe sex specific. Now, after using this you know, conventional methods and the London ATLAS method, now uh, there is a use of computers also. We need to have this app. And once you download this in your uh, system, then it is possible that you get an OPG and you apply the findings as per the criteria given here. An image like this will automatically you will get. You can compare this image with this particular OPG of under query and the age also we can obtain and use this as a reference in your report writing sheet also. However, the most common preferred method is the demergence method, which we have the which you have seen the various stages, okay? And uh, this has been population tested uh, in various populations, even in our population, uh, credit to Dr. Ashit and uh, his team for giving the Indian formula based on this demergence method, which we widely apply here. So when I was applying this, the current trend, what I thought is why can't we have this method in handy in our mobile phone itself? So we, along with one of my IT friend, we designed this uh, uh, app, which, uh, which, is, which I currently have in my mobile. This is not for commercial use, this is only for personal use. So wherein we, uh, once we get the OPG through a, a mobile or a WhatsApp image, so we just enter the stages uh, of this particular teeth and automatically the score we get. Before that, we need to select whether it is a male or a female. Okay, so accordingly, we just enter it and we get the age. So it is just quite a handy tool, no need to log into your computer, open your Excel sheet. So this type of you know personal used mobiles can be made. Now, when we talk of dental age estimation, ultimately the court asks is the probability. 
as uh, Vermasai was addressing the use of statistics, which is considered to be the main backbone of uh, forensic investigations. So when we talk of these statistics, the court always asks for the probability. Though the Indian um, standards are not well established, we don't have this, but according to a study based on the American Board of Forensic Odontology, uh, based on a study by Minser et al., uh, these two, James Lewis and, the, and his team developed an app, or uh, it's a software, we call it as UTH, wherein you just uh, enter the stages of the third molars, all the third molars, upper right and left and lower right and left third molars, we automatically, of course, we need to enter the other details like even the country of origin, date of birth, sex, everything. And automatically we get the uh, age calculated and also the probability that this person is above 18 or below 18. So this type of uh, tool, once you, in this particular app, you can also go for a test of the report, uh, printing of the report, and we can submit that report in the court of law. However, the result obtained is based on the studies done on a non-Indian population. So the current trend is that, like we need to focus more on the uh, statistics and especially the probability uh, in, in, in this particular age estimation uh, methods. Uh, uh, of course, we are need, we need to follow the ABFO guidelines, the methods which we need to apply. Because whenever we get a, a specimen or a sample, uh, uh, maybe a mandible or a maxilla or a single tooth, you know, the confusion always arises, which method to be followed, okay? So there is a flowchart given by the ABFO and we need to uh, follow certain guidelines on this. So when we Get a mandible like this with some few teeth present. So you can see here, if we have only this teeth, what type of methods can be applied? If you have these three teeth here, so which methods we can apply here? But suppose we are having only the molars, then which method you can apply here? So this knowledge uh, training on this type of you know approach need to be given here. As we can see here in this particular case that this came from the forensic medicine department. Uh, one molar has been removed from here uh, for DNA analysis. So this specimen, one tooth from this uh, particular mandible was extracted and that went for a DNA analysis. Ideally, in uh, what the international organization says that the premolars are the ideal candidate for a, for a DNA analysis pro and also the third molars. If the third molar, especially impacted teeth are there, they are the best candidate for a uh, extraction for a DNA. Now the current trend with the advent of technology like use of CBCT. Now age estimation methods also, you know, these methods also gain entry for the age estimation. So now various reports are being done on the application of uh, cone beam computer tomography, CBCT, for the estimation of age. Now we come to the usefulness of teeth in sex determination. Of course, the most preferred one is the metric analysis of the uh, dentition or an individual tooth. The dimensions of the teeth or a set of teeth are taken using digital vernier caliper. Early initial days, you know, the 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 divider, you know, was used and scale were used, but now with the use of digital vernier caliper, you know, the accuracy rate can be further increased. And also the non-metric traits are used, that there are certain traits on the teeth, which are, you know, uniquely characteristically seen on the female and characteristically seen on the male. So that particular trait, if for example, we get one canine tooth, and from that tooth, is it possible to tell whether this tooth belongs to a male or a female? So this type of doubt questions arises. So a close observation of the tooth, especially in the canine, especially in the, in the ridge here, the distal accessory ridge, what we call it as, if they are more pronounced, that means there is more possibility that this is a male. Again, here comes the uh, discriminant function analysis, the, the, the statistics. 
the, the use of statistics here is required and a lot of uh, a high scale data of this particular trait need to be evaluated. And uh, from the truth, it is also possible to determine the sex through the bar body. But now uh, the recent studies are being done using the dimorphic enamel peptide analysis, uh, where you know they use um, a minimal amount of enamel etching uh, done and they apply the liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. So we as a dentist are not much aware of these uh, biotechnology methods. So here the application of a multidisciplinary aspect, like a forensic science student and a forensic odontology join hands together to come up with further research on this type of uh, uh, studies so that we get more data and they are evidence-based. Uh, usefulness in species determination also, you know, uh, when we especially visit a mass uh, uh, burnt uh, scene, uh, like the one which I recently visited here, we collected the debris, you know, we may not be at the initial stage, may not be able to distinguish a tooth from other debris. So a close observation, you know, and depending on the temperature, you know, the color of, of the teeth, bone teeth also changes. So it was very difficult for me at that time when I need to isolate the uh, teeth from that crime scene, uh, from that fire accident scene. So now the technology is there. Uh, some base or EDX uh, spectroscopy methods can be applied to determine whether the tooth belongs to an animal or a human. And sometimes, you know, surface anatomy may not be that much conclusive. We cannot be based, uh, rely completely on the dental morphology to differentiate whether it is a human tooth or an animal tooth. Okay, this has happened uh, in one of our cases where the forensic medicine people thought that a long rooted canine to be an animal tooth. Okay, so however, it was found to be a human tooth. So now the technology is there, the trend has to be evolved, like protein radioimmunoassay techniques can be used to you know, distinguish the human samples from the non-human samples. Again, I stress this point of the multidisciplinary approach or uh, research in this particular aspect. Uh, obtaining DNA from the tooth, it's a very uh, well-known phenomena. We use that uh, one of the source of DNA is tooth. And there are various methods of uh, getting the, the DNA from the tooth. 0.1 to 1 nanogram is sufficient, rest the PCR will take care of. Now, the racial differentiation also, metric and non metric traits are being applied. A lot of literature comes uh, you know, on these uh, two parameters in uh, racial differentiation. Now, population variation in the dentition also need to be addressed. Now, the world is shrinking now. Globalization is taking place. You know, the, there is change in the gene flow. Now, uh, with the use of population genetics and especially the Hardy-Winberg equilibrium, which is used in population genetics, we came out with a novel idea of applying this in the uh, dental uh, variations. So this was one of our study, which was published uh, last year. Uh, maybe two years back. So where we used one particular tooth trait and, uh, you know, uh, used the absorbed frequency and we also estimated the expected frequency of that particular using, an, in a novel way, the hardy winberg equilibrium. The concept which was used in genetics, like the alleles, the pair, so the same thing we used as a right-left pair. And based on that, it was uh, uh, published. And this is... Uh, uh, based on only one, uh, one or two teeth. Actually, we use only the premolar and the molar. Uh, similar studies can be conducted on a, on a larger scale with other teeth too. Now, when we want to, the current trend, when we want to do a non-metric uh, trait analysis in dental anthropology or forensic odontology, earlier, the standard we used was the Asuda's uh, plug, Arizona State University, dental anthropology system, the full form of ASUDAS. So we uh, procured this type of, uh, you know, the dye-based dye dental stone model of these traits. Uh, but now uh, this system has been stopped and we are getting this uh, uh, acrylic type uh, uh, Turner-Scott system. 
okay so this can be used as a reference so any uh, future uh, any type of studies which is uh, required on dental non metric traits uh, we need to use those standards again this was a universal standard now coming to the bite mark uh, analysis we all know that uh, it's a very controversial uh, topic uh, not much uh, you know uh, uh, accepted we know that us court also has stated that the witness must be able to identify the published works that define um, the operational parameters of any test we need to uh, conduct so there is a diverse of opinion regarding the bite mark identification and uh, studies have also shown that the effect of training and experience in the examiner uh, also has little effect on the use of this technique especially when we use the digital analysis especially the digital overlay methods are used hence there is lot of um, research data which is required uh, in this regard um, earlier um, we use a hand tracing method this is one of our case where we applied both the conventional as well as the uh, the digital overlay technique the hand tracing has been uh, now replaced by the use of digital overlays so bite mark analysis have been highly criticized so this we need to understand and uh, you know uh, uh, more ahead only when we have sufficient data to validate uh, our findings uh, of course when the technology is improving the application also increases so uh, now 3d scanners and 3d overlays are being used even in the uh, bite mark analysis so this is our the examples of how the 3d overlays can be used in the uh, bite mark analysis now coming to the craniofacial superimposition Uh, this is another domain where forensic odontology or the dentistry can be applied we usually digitize the skull and the face photographs we evaluate to the best fit we can get with the skull and the morphometric uh, examination of the of the photographs so uh, now this also has evolved into a very uh, standard process uh because the uh, there is one project or which gives the objectives or guidelines on this particular method so photographic enhancement then coming to the skull modeling again it can be a conventional modeling or a 3d modeling then skull face overlay and the measurement now this computer aided is mainly by superimposition video superimposition and now we are also using the 3d superimposition just to give why a uh, one example it's this uh, a skull and we just have one case okay this person went missing some 7 years back after that till 7 years he was not to be traced and he is declared dead and we get a skull uh, this is me only huh? so just give an example i have done this is just an example of a super imposition method so being a forensic odontologist we concentrate more on teeth so a uh, simple application of superimposition on the dental aspect also can give us some result of course this is this skull does not belong to this person now facial reconstruction is a it's another trend which is now evolving uh, it's truly an anatomical art or an artistic anatomy which we do not know but uh, a great hype has been created on this facial reconstruction and facial approximation uh, here i want to you know highlight the works of uh, my colleague uh, dr arjun kundu uh, is a forensic odontologist my classmate and uh, a highly skilled person in the forensic facial reconstruction using this uh, 3d as well as the conventional models so these are the exhibits of the works of uh, that uh, a great uh, uh, person who in uh, you can exam you can observe all these in in the forensic odontology uh, center here in gfsu so uh, use of the facial approximation in uh, solving the crime mystery or in identification process can be a emerging tool but as i told already certain guideline need to be followed when we do this deal with the facial superimposition so this is the project called as a meprox project where we need to you know follow certain 
guidelines which are given certain parameters need to be followed and uh, this there are certain objectives also of this project now slowly the digital uh, technology is also you know entering into the forensic field and uh, as uh, we see that uh, the trades which we made uh, last year that is so these are the wax carved uh, uh, trades you know based on the observation we carved this using the dental wax now these are subject to thermal changes so we wanted to do a 3d printing so thanks to the efforts of dr abraham and dr gargi in nfsu so we are in the process of um, converting this into a three dimensional uh, scanning and then getting the 3d printing of these particular traits and uh, we also submitted um, uh, actually whenever we were dealing with certain cases of skeletal remains when we get a mandible you know we used to have a one tooth for example the canine tooth if the canine tooth is present on the left side and the canine tooth on the right side is missing now if at all we have both the canines then it would be a very valuable tool in estimating the gender in determining the sex of that particular person how we use the parameter of the intercanine distance so that we get the canine index and application of that parameter into the statistical formula we get whether this person is a male or a female but what happens if we don't have a canine so this was the question which was coming to my mind whenever i was doing these cases so how to overcome this situation so we uh, thought of you know uh, mimicking or preparing the using the cbct tools that we can reconstruct the uh, missing canine based on the anatomical feature of the present canine that means we call anteriors that is on the right side canine we use their morphology and use that and just to use the flip technology and we can make the uh, the missing canine so if at all we make that 3d model of that canine that can be 3d printed and we can implant that 3d printed canine into the socket and we can get the intercanine distance so this arbitrary method so this was the concept behind which uh, we wanted to focus and work on uh, so that scenario like this can be overcome so this is uh, again a uh, uh, project so uh, final result are yet to be come now uh, digital image analysis again we use and ultimately in this particular cases what we did we just did the wax model uh, one of the cases where we uh, applied the intercanine distance using the wax model itself instead of going for a 3d printing now use of digital image analysis tools there are multiple use uh, even in the bite mark overlay you can see how we use the image and image tools to get a overlay of the bite mark on the uh, on the accused uh, uh, dentition uh, now we will see that uh, of course there are wide variations wide applications in the uh, in dentistry for uh, its scope in forensics uh, certain areas where uh, we feel that we are left out forensic odontologists are not involved in certain forensic cases especially the homicidal smoothering where uh, typical finding is the presence of bleeding spot and uh, you know the tear of the uh, frenum all these are the signs where forensic odontologist uh, rule can be applicable uh, post mortem pink tooth uh, is another important phenomena where we can see that uh, uh, the discoloration of the teeth uh, these are the areas where much research has not been done and Uh, they need to be you know applied in a day to day basis or considering the amount of drowning cases we receive in fsl or in um, forensic medicine so much scope of research in this domain one of my friend dr tamrai he did a animal based study uh, especially in this drowning case and to came out with a uh, new you know findings a uh, hanging case also 
the indentations of the teeth, the bite mark, all these can be used as a dental uh, parameter or dental evidence in such cases. In burn case, of course, it is there. Uh, toxicology cases also, the, uh, the finding of certain uh, important findings in the gum lines can be useful uh, for forensics. In drug abusers also, the dental finding plays a very important uh, role. In child abuse and child neglect cases also, there is a scope of application of forensic odontology. So what is the need of the R uh, right now? Uh, we need a standardized approach of forensic caseworks and research in India. And we also need certain guidelines and protocols to set up as per the Indian scenario. And of course, last but not the least, we need to have a better application of statistical tools. So uh, the last slide, the message, what I want to tell to those young budding uh, forensic scientists or forensic odontologists over there, uh, think higher, but don't miss the smaller things. You know, uh, there is a large scope of, you know, doing research in the available dental models. These are easily available in any dental colleges or from any dentist. So with the amount of information you have from this uh, thing, you can always uh, explore the hidden facts or the hidden things in forensic science. So with this, I uh, finish my lecture and I thank uh, the organizers, especially Dr. Ranjit sir for this opportunity. And I hope I have done justice to the topic which I have given to you all. Thank you very much.